Good day, everybody. Welcome to our next dissection series. My name is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, and today, at the behest of our students, I've decided to give a quick video demonstration of the functional and the surgical aspects of the calf region, namely the triceps surae and the tendo calcaneus. I'm a surgeon by profession, and I'm also a neuroscientist. This time, I've decided to do a few surgical dissection videos. So let's take a quick look. This is a prone cadaver and what you're seeing in front of you, the left leg has been dissected. This is basically a continuation of the dissection that we did previously of the popliteal region. This time we are dissecting out the calf region. The triceps surae includes, as you can see in front of you, the two heads of the gastrocnemius and the soleus underneath, all of them inserting onto this tendon called the tendocalcaneus. So these three together constitute what is known as the triceps surae. Tri means three, surae refers to the word calf. Before I go into the details, let me mention a quick word about testing of the triceps surae. The triceps surae, the main function is plantar flexion of the foot, and therefore clinical testing involves asking the patient to plantar flex his foot against resistance, or alternatively, you can ask the patient to stand on his toes, whereby the weight of the body will act as the counter traction, and you will be able to test whether he has got plantar flexion intact or not. So that's a few quick words about the triceps surae and its components. Now let's go a little deeper and let's take each component one by one. The gastrocnemius. Why is it called gastrocnemius? The gastrocnemius is because the word gastro means belly. The gastrocnemius includes two fusiform shaped muscles which look like bellies, two muscle bellies. That's why it's called the gastrocnemius. As you can see in front of you, it's got two heads, a medial head and a lateral head of the gastrocnemius. The medial head is slightly larger than the lateral head and one thing we notice is that the medial, the inner portions of the two heads are fleshy and the outer portions of the two heads are tendinous. Let's take a quick look at the origin of the medial head and the lateral head. The medial head takes origin from the, the popliteal surface of the femoral condyle just above the femoral condyle, medial femoral condyle itself. And the lateral head takes origin from the lateral surface of the lateral femoral condyle. And the two heads then unite to form the calcaneus tendon. What is the main function of the gastrocnemius? The gastrocnemius, as you can see, it's crossing the knee joint and it's getting inserted onto the ankle. It's got functions both on the knee joint and as well as the ankle joint. It functions as a flexure of the knee and it also acts in plantar flexion. However, it cannot perform both the functions to their fullest extent simultaneously. So therefore, the gastrocnemius can function to its best extent as a plantar flexion only when the knee is fully extended and slightly dorsiflexed. Conversely, when the foot is, when the knee, when the knee is completely flexed, the gastrocnemius is incapable of producing plantar flexion. So what is the functional role of the gastrocnemius? The gastrocnemius fibers are actually the white muscle fibers. They are the fast twitch type of or type two muscle fibers, which are easily fatigable. Therefore, the gastrocnemius is useful for running, jumping, sprinting. It is very, only very intermittently used on sustained standing. Otherwise, most of its action is for quick work, like running or jumping, as I mentioned to you. That's about the role of this gastrocnemius or the main function of the gastrocnemius muscle. Let's take a quick look at some clinical correlations pertaining to the gastrocnemius alone. As I told you, the medial, the medial button, uh, belly is a larger one and most of the clinical correlations pertain to the medial belly. The origin of the medial belly is very close to the passage of the popliteal artery and therefore the medial belly can sometimes produce compression of the popliteal artery in what is known as the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome and as i mentioned in my previous dissection popliteal artery entrapment syndrome has got type 1 to type 6 out of which type 2 is due to a lateral migration of the medial belly at its origin and which can produce the compression of the popliteal artery or in type 3 of the love and valian classification there's an abnormal fibrous uh, muscular slip of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, which can complex the popliteal artery. Likewise, there's something called gastrocnemius strain, which is seen in people who are playing racket sports or tennis. There may be a partial rupture of the medial gastrocnemius fibers at its insertion to the tendocalcaneus. And that produces a painful condition in the calf, which is known as the tennis leg. So we can see most of the clinical correlations of the gastrocnemius pertaining to the medial belly of the gastrocnemius, which is the larger belly and which is functionally more active. Now let's take a look at the muscle which is under the gastrocnemius. Here the gastrocnemius has been cut and partially reflected off and then you can see the soleus. 
Why is it called the soleus? It is a flat muscle and it sole refers to the flat fish which is found lying at the bottom of the seabed on its sides. That's why this has been called the soleus. The soleus takes origin in an inverted U-shaped fashion on the back of the leg. It runs on the back of the fibula, it goes up and it gets inserted and runs, uh, runs continuously on the back of the fibula and the tibia and in between the two there is a small fibrous arch which is known as the tendinous arch of soleus. So that is the inverted U-shaped attachment of the soleus. And inferiorly, its fibers get first inserted onto the undersurface of the aponeurosis of the tendocalcaneus, which will later become tendinous, which I shall mention a little later. So this is the soleus. Obviously, the soleus does not take origin anywhere from the femur. Therefore, it does not have any action on the knee joint. All its action is entirely concentrated on the ankle. It is the most important plantar flexor and it can act as a plantar flexor of the foot irrespective of the position of the knee, unlike the gastrocnemius, which could not perform any plantar flexion when the knee was flexed because it also had action on the knee joint, namely flexion. Soleus is the most important. So what is the main functional use of the soleus? Soleus is the muscle which is useful for sustained standing, symmetrical standing, because it is continuously, the fibers are slow muscle fibers, they are red, they are slow twitch, and therefore they are type 1, they are fatigue resistant, they are anti-gravity, they are postural muscles, therefore they prevent the tendency of the body to fall forward and therefore they are responsible for sustained action. This is the role of soleus. So therefore, to summarize the actions of both these two together, we say that we stroll with our soleus while we run, jump and sprint with our gastrocnemius. Soleus is for sustained use so, and gastrocnemius is for intermittent, quick, rapid use. There is not much important clinical correlation pertaining to the soleus per se because most of the clinical correlations will be pertaining to the tendocalcaneus, which I shall mention just a little later. In a very small percentage of the people, there is an accessory soleus which forms a third belly way down at its insertion in the tendocalcaneus and then it produces a swelling medial to the tendocalcaneus. That is called the accessory soleus. And rarely it can produce a painful swelling when the leg is under constant use or heavy usage of the leg. Other than that, the soleus per se does not have any important clinical correlations by itself. Before I come to the tendocalcaneus itself, I decided that I'm going to mention a few quick words about a small muscle which is sandwiched between the soleus deeply and the gastrocnemius superficially, namely the plantaris muscle. The plantaris muscle takes origin from the lateral femoral supracondylar line just above the origin of the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. And then the muscle quickly becomes tendinous and the long tendon then runs from lateral to the medial side and gets inserted onto the tendocalcaneus. So this is the plantaris muscle. Functionally speaking, the plantaris muscle does not have much use. Though a lot of muscles, spindles have been identified in the plantaris muscle, so therefore it may play some role in proprioception. As we know, muscle spindles are responsible for unconscious proprioception, though the exact functional use is not very clear. Sometimes this, tendo, this plantaris tendon can rupture with a painful snap again during racket sports or playing tennis and it can produce a painful condition of the knee. And uh, for beginners who are dissecting the leg, sometimes they can mistake this long thin tendon as a nerve and therefore this has been facetiously referred to as the fresh man's nerve. Because this tendon does not have any functional use, it can be used for tendon grafting for injuries of the hand. So these are the few quick words about the plantaris. Now let's come to the most important part and that is the tendocalcaneus itself. As I told you, the tendocalcaneus is actually the common insertion for all these muscles. The two heads of the gastrocnemius, the soleus and of course the plantaris. The tendocalcaneus is perhaps arguably one of the most important tendons of the leg and perhaps the most important tendon of the foot of the body itself. And it's a very powerful tendon. It starts from somewhere midway in the calf as an aponeurosis and very quickly it becomes very deep and very strong tendinous and it gets inserted onto the posterior surface of the calcaneus. As it gets inserted, it undergoes a 90 degrees lateral twist and this lateral twist is very significant. Because of this lateral twist, the fibers which come from the gastrocnemius, they come to be oriented laterally and the fibers which come from the soleus, which were inserted onto the undersurface of the aponeurosis initially and then becomes part of the tendocalcaneus, the fibers of the soleus, they come to be oriented medially. It is said that this lateral 90 degrees twist is important for the point, from the point of view of giving elasticity 
and springiness to our stands and gait. So that is the functional aspect about the tendocalcaneus or the tendocalcaneus. By the way, for those of you who are interested in historical aspects, have you ever wondered why it is called tendo Achilles, why it used to be called tendo Achilles? Well, according to the Greek mythology, there was a Greek hero called Achilles, who was the son of Peleus and Thetis. Somebody told his mother, Thetis, that if you dip your baby in the holy waters of the river Styx, he will be invulnerable in battle. And therefore, she caught him by his ankles and dipped him. And as luck would have it, his whole body became invulnerable except his ankles because she held him by his ankles. And during the Battle of Troy, he was shot by an arrow shot by Paris, which hit him in his ankle and therefore he died from that injury. Today, it is referred to as the weakest point in any human and any weakest point is referred to as the person's Achilles heel. So that much about the historical aspect about why it is called tendo Achilles, but the more modern term is tendo calcaneus. Let's take a few quick look at some of the clinical correlations before we come to the most important one. The tendocalcaneus, when you get inserted into the calcaneus, there are two per se in relation to this insertion. One is a subcutaneous bursa between the skin and the posterior surface of the calcaneus, which is referred to as a subcutaneous calcaneal bursa. And there is a deep bursa, which is referred to as a subtendinous calcaneal bursa between the tendon and the bone. Either or both of these bursae can get inflamed, producing what is known as calcaneal bursitis. When we are wearing a tight shoe, especially for the first time, friction of the shoe with the back of the knee heel can produce the subcutaneous calcaneal bursitis. And constant friction between the tendon and the bone can produce the subtendinous calcaneal bursitis. All of them can produce painful conditions of the back of the heel. All of us know the use of tendocalcaneus for eliciting the plantar reflex or the ankle reflex. When we tap it, there is a quick plantar twitch of the foot and that is dependent on the root values S1 and S2. And if the plantar tendon reflex, uh, the knee ankle reflex is weak, we say that the S1, S2 is weak. In people who are above the age of 40 or 45 years, repeated usage and wear and tear of the tendocalcaneus can produce a condition known as ten calcaneal tendinitis. And then it can produce a chronic painful condition of the calf and the leg. That brings me to the next important clinical correlation, and that is the calcaneal tendon rupture. The calcaneal tendon rupture can occur in one of two ways. One is if it's a continuation of the proceed of the condition known as calcaneal tendinitis, then it occurs in usually old age and it can rupture. And the other is when it can occur because of some traumatic injury. Then it can occur, of course, in any age group, but it can it usually happens in young adults. The most common site of rupture of the tendocalcaneus is approximately one to five centimeters proximal to its attachment to the calcaneus. And when such a thing happens, it produces a painful lump in the middle of the calf because the proximal muscles they pull the proximal portion here. Likewise, this patient obviously will not be able to perform plantar flexion because the most important role of the tendocalcaneus was plantar flexion. And plantar flexion is essential for walking. When we use the push-off phase of our gait, when we use our forefoot to push against the ground to propel ourselves forward, that gait will be lost. So therefore, these people will not be able to plantar flex and they will not be able to walk normally. Dorsiflexion will be excessive. Normally, we can dorsiflex a foot only up to 20 degrees from the neutral position, but in these people, dorsiflexion will be very excessive. And how will these people walk? These people will develop a unique stance. They will laterally or externally rotate their foot to the maximum extent possible by using their gluteus maximus at the hip joint. And concomitantly, they will extend their hip using the hamstrings and the gluteus, and they will extend their knee using their quadriceps and then they will use their mud midfoot instead of their forefoot to propel themselves forward. And that is the stance they will adopt for walking because they cannot plant reflex and therefore they cannot use the push off phase of the gait which we do with our forefoot. So that brings us to the next point. How do we repair this ruptured calcaneal tendon? Obviously, if we bring the two ruptured ends together and we suture them in a straight line, transverse line, then this repair is not going to last long or it may rupture again because there will be too much of traction exerted at the suture line. So therefore, the ideal way to do it will be what is known as a Z-plasty or a Z-plasty, where a small portion of the distal end of the tendon is removed and a small portion of the proximal portion of the tendon is removed, and the two ends are superimposed to each other, 
and they are sutured in the form of a Z. And therefore, the line of tension is distributed across in a Z fashion. That is known as a Z plasty. And after it has been repaired, obviously, we have to repair it by using a non absorbable suture, preferably stainless steel. And after that, we have to carefully repair the paratenone on cover on the cover of the calcaneal tendon. And thereafter, the patient has to be put on a full cast right from above the knee to the foot. Why above the knee? Because if you remember, we mentioned that the gastrocnemius muscle takes origin from the lateral femoral condyles and the medial femoral condyle. So therefore, we have to immobilize the knee joint also. And the cast has to be kept in place for at least three months, 12 weeks. And thereafter, the patient will require physiotherapy and rehabilitation for at least another three months. And full functional recovery can take up to six months. So that is about the surgical repair of the calcaneal tendon and its post-operative care. Thank you very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.